Um, if I may start, first of all, I'd just like to say how much of an honor it is to be here in front of so many esteemed people. Um, to be part of a TEDx is a very exciting event for me, personally. Um, I've always wanted to go to a TED. And about a month after I arrived here in Sudan, uh, I saw on Facebook that a friend of mine was or organizing a, a TEDx. So I very excitedly wrote to him on Facebook, and I said, how can I get a ticket? I wanted to be sitting in one of your seats right now. <laughs> okay, he writes back to me and he says, uh, I've got three questions for you. I think, wow, okay, this is easier. I thought maybe I just have to pay lots of money and get a ticket. He says, no, just answer three questions. Ooh, the magic three. So uh, first question, he says, how long have you been in Sudan for? Second question is, what do you think about the River Nile and its impact to Sudan? Hmm, that's a heavy one. <laughs> Third question, he says, if you could go to a TED, why and who would you like to hear talking about what subject? Okay, so my first answer, I say to him, I arrived in Sudan the 3rd of June, 2013. So I've been there about a month and a half. Answer to question number two. What would I do with the River Nile if I, if I had the op opportunity here in Sudan? Well, I said that I would pursue opportunities in agriculture, in uh, hydroelectric, and also I came from a tourism background in Cambridge, England, so I said there's also great opportunities to work in tourism using the, uh, the River Nile. Third answer, I said, if I got to go to a TEDx, I would love to hear someone talk about eco-construction, as a viable pathway forwards for the people of Sudan. Lo and behold, he writes back to me and guess what he says? Congratulations, you're a speaker at TED. <laughs> what can I say, I wasn't really expecting that. Anyway, here we are. So it is my honor to actually get to talk about the very subject that I was hoping I could learn a little bit more <laughs> about myself. All right, so what we're talking about here is eco-construction. Um, now, I want to touch on some, some slightly sadder topics to start with. We've, uh, we've got some obstacles in the way. Marmushkila, okay? Every problem has a solution. That's the way I like to see, see things. Um, but the problems are there. First thing, of course, is that we have overwhelming pollution problems. This isn't a situation isolated to this country. Not this, uh, not this continent, it is something which is a global problem. We all have to deal with it in one way or another, okay? So this scene of the young man walking through piles of garbage is probably quite familiar to almost all of us, I should think. Um, looking a little bit closer to home in Sudan, of course, earlier this year we had devastating weather conditions which destroyed many people's homes. Uh, if we look at some statistics, but I love the statistics here. UN. They believe that about a little over 110,000 homes were destroyed in Sudan. The main concentration was within the Khartoum state. Um, about 570,000 people are affected by this in one way, shape, or form. That's a lot of people, folks. That's people without homes, without shelter. And that's a problem. But like I say, problems always have solutions. So we don't always have to look at the dark side of things, OK? Um, plastic is one of the main things which I've become acutely aware of. Whoop, let's go back there. I've become acutely aware of here in Sudan. It is, again, not an isolated problem, however. If you can see from the diagram behind me here, this picture graph, there are islands, or what they like to call garbage soup, floating around in the Pacific Ocean, uh, masses which are two, if not three times the size of the state of Alaska. There's a lot of rubbish out in the world. Um, now, like I say, plastic bottles are of particular interest to me. These are things which I find all over the place. Uh, you should if anyone wants to pay a visit to me over at my apartment, you'll find my balcony is full of plastic bottles. All right? We'll get to that then. Um, 
Plastic has an interesting history. Someone came up with the idea of designing plastic back in uh, the, the, the mid-19th century. It had a slow start. Um, lots of the mainstream plastics, a few of which are named at the bottom of the plastic bottles there, started to come into circulation around the end of World War II, which is when plastic really took off. It replaced glass bottles worldwide. Um, big problem with plastic bottles. It takes 400 years to decompose a plastic bottle. Problems also have solutions. Okay? Uh, plastic bottles can also be used as bricks. Once we drink our water out of that, it is not a useless item. Okay, there are other uses for it, which we will get to. So, problems, solutions. First of all, what we need to do is really look at our friendship, our relationship with our ecosystem. We were born into it, we rely on it, and we ought to pay it a little bit more attention if we want to continue to be a part of it. Okay? Um, we have evolved as a species. We have learned to look after ourselves using the intellect that we were given, um, and part of this is architecture. Okay, when we started off, we were living in caves and so forth, and we realized that actually we had better means of looking after ourselves. Uh, us folk out in England, obviously, we live in very cold homes, so we built homes that keep us warm. Um, if we're living out in a desert, then we learn ways of keeping ourselves cool. All right, this is an evolution, and as part of that is part of the ecosystem. Um, so a few things to address are really the human need. Okay, in, in light of the problems that we've experienced here in Sudan, where do we start? Okay, where do we start? Well, my opinion is that in order for any human being to successfully strive and actually progress, there are a few fundamentals that need to be addressed. First of all is shelter. If you do not have shelter, how can you expect anyone to go out and work doing anything? You need shelter. Now, as I mentioned, plastic bottles, these are not useless once you empty them of the water that you bought them for. They can be used over and over again, and again mentioned, they can last for up to 400 years. I imagine if the, if the Crusaders had an opportunity to build their castles out of these things rather than stone, they would have considered it because they would last longer. Um, so you can see a couple of guys here building houses out of plastic bottles. All right, Give people shelter. Get them out of the elements that make life that little bit harder. Remove the stress off the individual, and we will inevitably remove the stress off the planet in the meantime. Next big problem, of course, is water. We all need water to survive, right? Without that, we're all done for. Now, again, whether you're in Africa or Europe, we're all facing the same problem about water. Okay? The sources that we acquire it from are diminishing. We have to look at other ways of sourcing our water. Uh, the rainwater is actually a very good place to start if you actually harvest your rainwater. Now, this might seem ironic in a sense, seeing is that, first of all, Sudan gets very, very little rainfall. Although I think all of you and I will agree on this point, which is that when it does rain, it rains hard. Okay? You can build yourself a cistern, which is in your house to collect all the rainwater that you would need should any problem arise and you cannot get water out of the, an aquifer. All right? Simple stuff. Um, what about all that extra rain when it rains really hard? Places are getting flooded, right? Well, again, we can actually start to look at ways of engineering the land so that it can catch water and then help grow trees, plants, which in turn uh, creates homes for birds, bees, all sorts of animals, which is part of our ecosystem. We are a reliant, codependent species. We need other species to be happy. Okay. Um, another very, very important building block to the, the, the prosperity of a human being's life, I would say, is food. I don't know about you guys, but I get hungry at least three or four times a day. Now, again, unfortunately, due to economic reasons, and uh, th this isn't just an isolated incident in Sudan, this is worldwide, we see the prices of food skyrocketing. Um, very, very sad story I have to share with you is that uh, about two months after I arrived in Sudan, I, uh, I went to buy some tomatoes out in Souk Arabi. Um, and when, yes, I live in Souk Arabi, you all think, oh my God, what's he doing out there? <laughs> Crazy Hawaja. 
Well, there I was, and I asked the man how much for the tomatoes, and he said, 20 pounds for a kilo. And all of a sudden, I heard a woman start crying behind me. Yeah. I looked behind, and I asked my friend, why is the woman crying? And he said, uh, she can't afford to buy herself tomatoes for her family tonight. I don't believe that anyone should have to cry over the fact they can't buy tomatoes for their family. Never. That's just not an option. So, with the fusion of ecosystems and architecture, what I propose, it's not my idea, but it's certainly a brilliant idea, is that we start growing food in our homes, in and around our homes. We can reuse that water which we've caught up to four times in the house. So when you wash your hands, bathroom, the kitchen, that water that can then go into a system which is inside your home, growing you fresh fruit and vegetables all year round. Free food. Wow. <laughs> now, this man is one of my great heroes. He's not particularly famous. He is in sort of eco circles and architecture groups. He doesn't have a big shiny car, he's not that rich, but he is a visionary man, he's got a big heart, and he's doing something good for the world. Now, what you can see playing behind me here is a very simple version of a structure that he's designed. He builds walls using car tires. I got very excited because I saw a big pile of car tires outside the dial center here. Um, on top, he uses bags of rubbish as insulation to help keep the structure cool. It has two layers to it so that the heat that hits the roof doesn't heat the rest of the building. There's a vent at the top also to allow air convection so that when there is hot air, we have air circulation. It's free air conditioning, people. All right, now he's building himself a cistern there. We'll get to that in a few moments. We have a gangway which is being created with a very, very important purpose. And this goes back to our point about water. All right, now this structure was built in Haiti in response to the tragedy out there. Michael Reynolds and his team went out to help them. Now, as you can see, when it rains, the water goes off of their roof into, Kel Sabriz, a cistern. <laughs> when you want to take a shower, you pour it into a bucket and pour it on yourself. That water then goes into another cistern under the ground, which then goes into a plant cell. Plants are actually one of the most miraculous filtration systems in the world. We don't need men to make them for us. They're already there. The water that then gets pumped out of that can be used in your toilet. Okay? So by this point, we've already used the water three times. All right, we're growing food. We've had a shower. We've gone to the toilet. But it doesn't stop there, of course. Once you flush your toilet, that dirty water, which is actually a, a way of spreading disease, things like cholera, can then be cleansed again by our lovely friends, the plants. They go through yet more plant cells, filtered out, and then the clean water goes back into the aquifers where it belongs. Free food. <laughs> now, my thing is... Now, at this point, I would like to uh, just touch on a very important thought. I'm going to refer to a quote by a very important man. <laughs> very inspiring words. Be the change that you want to be in the world. I got to Sudan, I really wanted to be that change. Okay, we can't change everything at once, but we start. So, what's my change? What, what are some of my first efforts? What I've done is I've met people, I hear what's going on, I ask questions, I get involved. This good friend of mine in the middle, Omar, told me about this lovely lady called Angel. She has been helping disabled children in Sudan and their mothers to school them and to teach the mothers how to, to support their families. They have absolutely no help, they have no money, but yet they try. When I found out about this place, I said, let's go sort something out. So that's what we did. We got there, we found out that basically they have uh, no classroom, uh, no center for medical attention, no kitchen for the mothers to prepare food for their children, nothing. 
The first thing that we had to address, though, was an old mud wall, which they were afraid would, would fall down on top of their kids. So we said, right, let's get started by fixing that. That was our first project. And guess what I started using on that wall? <laughs> Free stuff. Free stuff. All right. This is not something which is a national problem, it's a global problem. We all need to actually learn to embrace and work together a lot more. I'm happy to do it. The look on Angel's face would tell me the same. Um, on the final note, I hope that you will be the change that you want to see in the world. If you want to get involved in any way, have any questions, by all means, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much.